In the United States, we keep building dams on rivers to control flooding, but flooding keeps getting worse. So what's going on? Well, stay tuned ahead. I'll talk with Tim Palmer about Seek Higher Ground, the natural solution to our urgent flooding crisis. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Tim Palmer is an award-winning author of more than 30 books about rivers, the environment, and adventure travel. Ever since his first-hand experience during the Hurricane Agnes flood of 1972, he's remained actively involved in flooding and floodplain management issues nationwide as a land-use planner, writer, photographer, and river conservation advocate. He joins us to talk about Seek Higher Ground, the natural solutions to our urgent flooding crisis. Tim, welcome to Some Books Considered. Thank you, Dan. Great to be here with you today. Well, before we talk about the book itself, tell us about your experience as a flood survivor victim and how that energized you to want to write and investigate this topic. So this was 1972. I'm showing my age here. And um, a big storm was forecast. It was actually attached to a Hurricane Agnes which had blown up through the South and then happily moved offshore, but unexpectedly picked up more moisture in the Atlantic Ocean and came back to the central Appalachian Mountains and hovered over North Central Pennsylvania, where I happened to be living at ground zero of what became the most damaging flood in American history up to that time. And as it turned out, the house I was living in was not quite flooded. It came up to the last step on the front door, did not come in the house, but neighbors were hit very hard. And I ended up helping them and shoveling a lot of mud. And as soon as the roads opened, which was several days, because bridges were out, landslides were down, floods were raging. As soon as the roads opened, I went back to my job, which was as the environmental planner for Lycoming County, Pennsylvania. And in that role, I had the responsibilities not only of uh, considering recovery efforts, but more important in the long run to consider how we could avoid having a catastrophe like this happen again. And ultimately, that's what led me to, uh, to my book this year, many years later. So in the subtitle to the book, you talk about the urgent flooding crisis. So put this in perspective for us. How big of a problem are we looking at? Okay, just for a little bit of background, for for forever, really, our approach to floods has been inadequate. You know, first we tried to build dams to keep floods from occurring. Then we tried to build levees to separate them from our homes and businesses. Damages continued to rise in spite of that, in some cases because of those things. So a much more logical, sensible, simple, ecological, economic, equitable approach was available to us, which is just get out of the way. And this all occurred to me in the aftermath of that flood, because in that one flood alone, dams had filled, levees had burst. Relief was inadequate. We knew there had to be a better way. So in the, in the course of my career following that and a writing career, you know, over the next 40 years and writing this book, especially, I realized we have to do two things much better than we have done. We have to protect floodplains that are not now developed. And it turns out 90% of our floodplains are not heavily developed. The problem could be nine times worse than it is. We have to protect floodplains and we have to help people relocate to get out of the danger zone wherever they're willing to go. There's a lot in this book. We're not going to be able to talk about everything. So before we talk about more specifics in the book, give us a general overview. What are people going to find here? Well, I, I start out the way you started out with my personal experience in the Hurricane Agnes flood, because that was really the seminal event in my life and my career in writing about this issue. And uh, and I feel it's a very gripping story, you know, because it, it was a dramatic, newsworthy event of the time. And then I look at, quickly look at the history of floods, not in a comprehensive way, but 
I tried to identify the key floods in American history that resulted in changes in the way we regard floods. We could go into a lot of detail on those, but yeah, I'll just say read the book. Next, um, I looked at our, our dominant responses, build dams, build levees, provide relief, and identified the weaknesses, the shortcomings. Not, not that those in efforts were always misdirected or by any uh, stretch of the imagination misintended, but they were at, at least they were inadequate, we, and we had to take a different path. And then in detail, I go into how we can better manage floodplains and better relocate people and how we can reform things like the National Flood Insurance Program, which ends up being a critical player in all of this drama. So I want to come back and talk more detail about dams. And we build more and more dams, we build levees, but flooding keeps getting worse. So what is wrong with that approach? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, very good question. You know, we believed in dams almost religiously ever, ever since the Flood Control Act of 1936, which was the big event that caused even the Army Corps to realize that levees weren't adequate. Very, very curious. The Army Corps, which is the, the world's greatest dam builder, opposed building dams up until 1936, saying they would not be an effective way to solve this problem. They, it's not that they were right, they were wrong because levees were inadequate too. But after that, the Army Corps built 400 major flood control dams in America, not solving the problem. Every year, almost flood damages continued to rise. The critical reason being that people thought they were protected by the dams, but they weren't. So we continued to build in the floodplain. Floods continued to occur. The damages were used as justification to build yet more dams so people felt more secure when in fact they weren't. And on and on this ridiculous cycle continued. So that all came to an end basically in 1980 when the Stanislaw River of California was dammed. It was the last dam fight fought at the epic scale in America and lost. That dam was built for flood control but we haven't built any major flood control dams since because we realize now that that approach is not enough, that all the good dam sites have been built upon. We have to take a different track. And that for me, in my way of thinking, and many other people's way of thinking, is to protect floodplains and to relocate wherever we can. I'm talking with Tim Palmer about Seek Higher Ground, the natural solutions to our urgent flooding crisis. And our conversation continues in a moment. If you appreciate this discussion, please take a moment to subscribe so you'll know when I post new interviews. And thank you. Another problem you point out in the book with all of these dams that have been built is that there are also disasters in waiting because they're old, they're deteriorating, and if they fail, it's, you know, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. The, the most damaging flood in American history was from dam failures, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, 1889. The, the, uh, and, and that pattern has continued. The, the, most, the most fatalities in floods typically are from dam failures. Now, point of clarity, these are not usually the Army Corps of Engineers flood control dams. These are other dams built by private parties and businesses and mining companies and all that largely, well, I should say poorly regulated. And so we have unsafe structures. Many of them, we don't even know who the owners are anymore. These dams fail. And if you picture a normal flood coming from rainfall that goes on for a period of days, the river gradually comes up, eventually it floods. Dam failures are way different. They, they in effect, are a flood that results from the accumulation of years of runoff backing up behind that dam, all coming at once. So it's not like one rainstorm. It's like dozens of them at one time, extremely dangerous. Beyond that, you know, every one of these dams has safety issues. They're all getting old now. They require maintenance. We had lots of money to build new dams, almost no money to maintain and deal with safety issues afterwards. And ultimately, you know, if you look at the really long term, they're all going to be useless because they fill with silt 
eventually. Some of them are already filled with silt, others in the next century, and all the others beyond that, if not sooner. And so their capacity to absorb floodwaters will be negated for that reason. So that's clearly not the answer here. You've talked about the floodplain several times. And in nature, floodplains are actually beneficial for the planet. So tell us more about that. Exactly. There's a whole other side to the flooding coin here, Dan. And that is that you know, you've, we regard floods as these kind of disastrous, catastrophic, horrible events. But in fact, floods have been occurring since the beginning of time. It's part of the hydrologic cycle. Water evaporates, it goes into the sky, it rains, the rivers rise, flow back to the ocean. Sometimes it flows back to the ocean in really large amounts. It's always been that way. They're natural events. And the natural environment, including all the fish and animals and forests and the whole works, has kind of evolved to deal with that. And not only to deal with it, but to benefit from it. Floods are actually essential for groundwater supplies because when the water overflows, it soaks into the ground. Half our population depends on groundwater for their water supply. So if you want water to come out of the tap when you turn it, you got to like floods. Floods are, are what delivers silt and sand to our ocean shores. When you build a dam that blocks all that silt, there's no sand replenishing the beaches at the ocean in places like Southern California and Atlantic City. And so the ocean currents take that sand away and the buildings on the shoreline collapse. So if you like beaches, you got to like floods once you understand it. Fish depend on floods for their habitat. Floods create the diversity of flow in rivers. They nourish the riparian or riverfront vegetation that's very important to fish for shade and for feed, like from insects falling into the water. So if you like fish, you got to like floods. There's this whole other side to the coin that has been unrecognized. And uh, actually, it was one of the, 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 the funnest chapters I had to write about that, how that word, about how that image of floods became known largely through a film that was produced in the 1970s. When I was looking at that section of your book, I was reminded of a trip that I made to Egypt a long time ago. But as we were going down the Nile, our, our guide was pointing out that before they built the dam and created Lake Nasser, the Nile it was you know known as the Fertile Nile. But now without those floods, it's becoming more of a desert. It has really destroyed a lot of the arc, uh, agriculture along the Nile. A, a desert and just a somiasis and disease and all kinds of problems that have come from High Aswan Dam blocking that cycle of flooding. You know, the, the bottom line here, I would say, Dan, in my whole book, is that we have to regard the laws of nature more seriously. You know, it, what, what we have done is we've regarded the laws of nature is something that, that, that's optional for us to, to follow if we want to or not. And we've regarded our own practices, policies, habits, and laws as immutable when in fact we can change them whenever we have the collective will to do so. We have, we have effectively reversed the way the world really works. And so we need to recognize that the laws of nature are important. They're immu they are the ones that are immutable. Recognize the power of floods and live in harmony with that instead of living out this fantasy that we can prevent floods from occurring. I'm wondering also, you know, given the situation we've set up now with the dams and other things we've engineered, and now we have global warming on top of that. How has that impacted what's been done and what might happen in the future? You know, this is really what triggered me to write the book. I've known, you know, most of this for years because I've been associated with flooding work most of my adult life. But then when I realized that global warming, global heating, we should really say, is causing the floods to get worse, I realized that this kind of state of denial we've been in forever about flooding and flood damage is just not going to work anymore. You know, the problems are going to become so severe that we're going to have to recognize it and begin to chart a different path. 
because of global warming, I mean, there's tons of data on this that I present in the book. But one real basic point is that the floods will be rainfall and floods will be 4% greater just from the raising temperature of the atmosphere alone. And then we also have issues like the, uh, the aggravation of extremes in climate, big droughts followed by big floods. It's going to happen more and more with global heating. And that, of course, means higher floods. So what we've done has not worked. And guess what? Now the problem is going to get way worse. We've simply got to chart a different path. And that is what my book is all about. So what do you hope readers will do with this information after they've read your book? Well, this is, you know, this is wishful thinking. But as a writer and a logical person, as a historian and, uh, you know, just designer and scientist, I hope that people will be impressed by the facts to realize that we have to do something different. But really, the way it works is people are mostly motivated by emotions. And it turns out that floods are, a, are very emotional events. I know I was in one. You know, the heartbreak that goes with the destruction and the devastation and the loss of property and even life with floods is, is just overwhelming to people who experience it. And so I think that, com that you know, the information combined with the just kind of visceral feeling that we get from flood damage and also from the magic of natural rivers, you know, from natural rivers functioning as they should with tremendous beauty that, you know, we would recognize if we weren't sitting directly in the way of the flood, that all these things combined will motivate people to, to act and to think differently. And of course, that works from the bottom up. I hope to impress people. I hope to impress the people who are in charge of the, the national and state and local policy regarding floods, because we need changes in the legal structure changes in the policies that our agencies administer. You know, I'm hoping that better awareness of all this will result in a more effective approach towards solving this problem. You know, I'd like to also say just that, and maybe it's evident so far, but floods for me are this very integrative event. You know, they, they involve tragedy and triumph. They involve nature and engineering, economics, equity, or issues of equity ecology, all of these things come together in this issue of flooding. It's really a story of life in America today. And that's what really drew me to this project. And so to answer your question, I, I hope that interest and fascination for that story, it will, will resonate with other people as well. Well, to learn more, the book is Seek Higher Ground, The Natural Solutions to Our Urgent Flooding Crisis by Tim Palmer. Tim. Thank you for talking with me today. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be with you. If you'd like to purchase Seek Higher Ground, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors and a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.